Hi, good morning. Uh, so, yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I thought uh, for a moment uh, in my life that it would be clever to be uh, learning something about engineering. But then, uh, I still wanted to be a physio. So what I did there in, in, the, in the company that did the wireless EMG, I was sort of uh, helping to design a software that we can use in the clinic. So it gave me a chance to, to work a lot with the EMG and understand what's happening in, in training, etc. So you will see that software here later on. So in this session, I will talk a little bit about EMG and biofeedback. Uh, we will do a practical session. And in the end, we will uh, discuss some uh, more learning points. <clears throat> when we train, we are always doing something to affect the nervous system. And it would be cool if we could just talk to the brain and, you know, not make the connection to the person, talk directly to the brain, see what's going on, what's happening, how can we solve this. But we can do, not do that, but there is a chance to interact with the brain, and, and that's with the biofeedback. So biofeedback gives you uh, like an extra information. It's an extra information for uh, the patient or the one that is trained. It's also an extra information for the trainer, and it's called eccentric feedback as opposed to the intrinsic feedback that we all have. There are a lot of studies uh, that show that biofeedback can be beneficial. It's, it's not all glory. Sometimes you don't have results and sometimes you have good results. Uh, but generally, uh, I think clinicians that use uh, biofeedback and, and people that make uh, scientific uh, publication about biofeedback uh, uh, would say it, it, it works pretty well. A traditional biofeedback study is you have a training group that does a training protocol and another training group that use uh, biofeedback plus the training protocol and uh, a control group. The problem with those studies is the same problem that we see here, that any time we, uh, we make an uh, assumption about exercises and how they work, we use what has been published in, uh, in the literature about studies that activate the scapular rotators of shoulders, studies that activate the gluteus medius, the, the quadriceps, etc. Most of them are based on healthy population. There's a lot of vari variety in how people react to, to exercises, and it's, it's even a, a more variety in, in patients. How do they react to, uh, to exercises and prescription that, that we do? So, uh, in Aspetara, we've uh, come to the conclusion, we, and I, I think a lot of people have, we have to tailor the, the program to the, to the person that is in front of you. We have to train what is in front of you. But still, you use the information from the uh, literature. We're going to have a practical session here today, and I'm, I'm just going to show you what I, what I do in my <coughs> clinical work. Martina is a physiotherapist working here at Aspita, uh, elite uh, volleyball player. She's had uh, injuries to her knee, and <coughs> it's been going on for a, for a very long time. I show her only one uh, result of the MRI study because uh, the list was so long, so I, I couldn't put everything on. <laughs> but, but she has uh, had problem for a very long time. But she's still playing. And today, uh, when I met her, I met her, uh, well, I knew about her problem. I <laughs> met her a long time ago. And I, I thought when, uh, when I was doing this lecture, well, that maybe she would be a, a good candidate to, to show you. And uh, last week, we did a first session. 
And uh, these are her symptoms uh, when she meets me. And from this picture, we can conclude that she has uh, arthrogenic muscle inhibition. And that is described like an afferent sensory input from the joint. It activates inhibitor interneurons in the spinal cord. And that leads to decrease in excitability of the motor neuron pool from the, for, from the brain. And the result is decreased activation of the, of the muscles. And as a consequence, if you look long term, it's, it's going to create uh, muscle atrophy. I'll show you first uh, a video here of the, of the test that we, we do. And uh, I will discuss the results later. And first, we do a calibration. Uh, and we see max voluntary contraction. And then we do a test uh, which is called a timing test. It does measure the timing of activation between the patella trackers. It's a very simple squat movement. We could also do a, a single leg squat. In this case, uh, see uh, her symptoms were too high so that I, I couldn't do a, a single leg squat. Timing is important, but also the, the ratio of activation between the vastus medialis and vastus lateralis. And, and when we have knee pain, we, we need to look further up the kinetic chain, look to the hips and, and even the pelvic low back control and also to the foot. In her case, uh, timing was uh, not an issue. So, uh, it makes the problem a little bit more simple. When we have a timing problem, we have to address that first before we can go to strength exercises. But she had, uh, as, you, as you might see here on, uh, on the screen, a, uh, a activation uh, issue. So this is vastus lateralis and vastus medialis on the left side. And this is on the right side. And you see the left side is showing uh, higher activation. And that relates to muscle efficiency. See, see, it means actually she's weaker on the left side. And therefore, she has to recruit uh, the muscle much more to do the same task. For the right, the task is easy, as it should be. So we don't get a, a very big signal from the right side. So it's an inverse. Uh, relationship. All right, let's uh, do a... So this is my uh, second session, basically, with uh, Martina. I gave her some uh, home exercises based on the first session. Now we have the sensors on, so we have to reset the scaling here. So we, <coughs> we can do a strength test and a MVC calibration at the same time. Let's start with the with the good leg here. Okay. Okay. Okay, you can go. All right, relax. Is teasing me a little bit. Not giving me a signal. Okay. Again, let's try. 
It's the same. All right, let's do the left one. That's more important. There we go. You go. All right. Yeah. Yep. You're okay? Mm -hmm. Last one. Yeah. Go. Nice. Let's try the right one again here. I think it's it's okay now. Let's go, yeah. All right, it's fine, thanks. So uh, there's a thing called impetance, it's a resistance of the skin. So for this one sensor, the took a little bit longer time for, for the electrode to adapt to the skin. Now I can lock the scale. The software picks up automatically the, the highest signal and calculates over a one second interval the, the average RMS. So we can work, look at them relatively, how they work relatively. And usually uh, we, are, we sort of, I think we are of, often a victim of our old habits and it's, it's very common in, in physical therapy and sport medicine to think about the terminal extension. We need to get the terminal extension after a knee operation, for sure. And we often train it in, in open kinetic chain. But after I started to use the, the biofeedback, I would always start to train the terminal extension in, in closed kinetic chain. And that's what one of my favorite exercises to start with. And it's easier for the, for the patients and, and simply I get better, better activations. So we will have a look at that. So if you just stand up, and that's sort of a word last time at least. So mm -hmm. let's hope it works again. <laughs> okay, you go. Very nice. You could bo do it both slowly and try to get a good contraction at the end. And she's also using speed. We found out in the first session that speed was uh, a good stimulus for her to, to learn how to activate. We see a fine activation here on the, <laughs> on the muscles. But she is, uh, we could say that she, she's she wants to activate the lateral part more than the, the medial part, okay? So we had that, that problem. And then we can look at some exercises. Basically, we would now try to say, can we somehow focus the medial part activation in the exercises? So the first thing that I do is give her a chance to do it. So I, I'm not going to interfere. So you will try to see if you can do that. You just use the, the biofeedback. Okay, all right. It worked better last time, but yeah, okay. <laughs> it's the weather, right? That's okay. So then, then we might have some uh, ideas uh, how to change that. So if, if you give me a chance to put elastic around your foot, and I'm going to pull from this side, you're going to do a stand squat, okay? Uh, you, no, support on the, on the back leg like that. You do a stand squat, okay? And you go. 
ะโอเคและ and I pu- try to pull from the back as well Let me go again How does that feel Yeah is there pain Okay So it's, it's better from the death? Yeah. Why don't you stay there and just, just work there like a skier, you know? Yeah. Okay. So you feel it's better if I pull from the, from the back? Yeah. R- related to pulling from the, from the side. Yeah, okay. Then you can have a dumbbell here. If you take that dumbbell, you hold that in front of you. And you can hold it also on your right shoulder, yeah. Up there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay, that's good. So we're having a small success here. We are we're changing a little bit the the dominance of the activation. The reason I put on a dumbbell is it activates the core. So in engaging the core often helps with the activation of, of the extremities, as been shown in studies. And from the right side, I'm obviously thinking of diagonal vector to the, to the left hip. All, all right. Now let's try the side steps. And pulls, you can with the dumbbell. It's okay if you're okay. Yeah, yeah. Have a look. Of, have a look at what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So you can punch from the, like, with the left. Yeah. So now, that's working, right? You fatigued? You're okay? Yeah. That's good, okay. Now you can do the, the step up. All right. Good. You're okay. Yeah. Uh, you can show them uh, the sit back. I have video of those exercises also. But sit back is here. That one here. Okay. Last one. <laughs> Good training for you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Take care of the dynamometer there on the table. <laughs> Just let me get it out of the way. Nothing happened to a drug. Just to, you know. <laughs> all right. Still okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, that was better. Really? Okay. Yeah. So she's doing some tricks to change the activation, and that's the feedback for her. Gives her some information on what to do. How's the pain? No, nothing. No, nothing. Okay. So you don't feel anything now. Okay. All right. Fine. Thanks a lot, Martina. So this was our second uh, training session. So maybe you can see how, how interactive this is, uh, how much information we get while we are training to modify our, our training and to find out what is best for us on the day. Obviously, since uh, I've used the biofeedback for so long time, when I train, I, I started to realize some new exercises, uh, new ideas, how to work. In the beginning, I thought something was wrong with the system, you know, because I, I had to change the way that I, I think. But now I think the system is okay, you know. I'm okay too. So, <laughs> so the, what I see, have seen is that you, one of the biggest uh, activations exercises for vastus medialis is to get get the athlete out of this position to get out of that position it's actually a valgus position and but i think in sports valgus is it's a very very common common thing thank you motor learning this is what we are doing this this session is basically motor learning and we have uh, this theory from Fitz and Posner. It's, it's an old theory, ther theory where we go from cognitive to autonomous states when we are learning a new skill. So what we have thought about this in physical therapy is that, OK, that means that we have to do exercises on a cognitive level. We have to do easy exercises, like an isometric contraction or lying people on the floor supine. And then we move to associated states, and from the associated states, then we are doing exercises like that. And then we, from there, we move to autonomous states or more sport-specific exercises like the one that we saw here. But in my world, it, it doesn't really work like that. I see, and the theory does only say that you need cognitive understanding. So I can use any of those exercises to help the client to find the muscle. So the best one for vastus medial is to wake up is not necessarily the easiest one. It's the one that the patient understands, yes, there is my muscle, now it's working. So I've let athletes jump, drop jumps, do fast exercises like she did in the beginning, just to make the connection. Once you have the connection, then it actually transfers to other type of, of exercises. So I've been, I've been concerned about this. How do we learn on a concession stage? That's what happens here with the Fitz, Fitz and Posner theory. But can we actually shorten the process? Is that possible? Do we sometimes learn on an unconscious level? And I think we do. I think actually the brain is starting to understand what happens even before we see it on a, on a cognitive level. And, and this is uh, what I see in my, my training. And it can happen very fast. So this is Martina, the first session that we have had. And I put on the sensors, and then I went to the other room to find the dumbbell for her. And while I was doing that, she learned how to activate the, the vastus medialis. That was incredible. Of course, she's a sport person, and, and for them, it can often happen very quickly that they get the connection. Uh, this year, we had a footballer here. He, 
he had the same problem, uh, not a, a knee problem, but he had to learn to activate a certain muscle group. Happened like that. And it was sustainable. Uh, this is also in, important. Still good with time. So what we did is, in the session, we tested her in the beginning. She could hold isometrically 35 kilos. In this test, she is, and the pain was 4 out of 10. In this test, she is holding 50 kilos after a few exercises, after three exercises, and the pain is uh, 1 out of 10. And in the end, she did 55. And Pain is 3 out of 10. So that's the consolidation state on that day. We, we moved from the initial state to the console state. And this slow state is actually that. That means, you know, it, it takes time to learn it, but you, you master the skill. So that's where we want to go. And, and, and she's there in her uh, sport. Retention is very important. How can we make this sustainable? So you saw today that we, are, we still have a lot of work to do. So she learned a lot on the first day. Maybe she learned also something here. We have to work with that and make it sustainable. And usually we do that by repetition in training. But variability is very important and attention is very important. So uh, I think I'll skip that one. That's the first exercise that you saw. Yeah, you already saw that one. Here's the second one. We did those three exercises in a, in a row. And you see there is an uh, eccentric control of her doing the simple single leg squat exercise. Again, in this exercise, there is eccentric control, but it's a little bit different. And here we are coming to more uh, sport-specific things. And at the end there, there is eccentric control. And she told me this is one of the things that uh, gives her pain. So we are training the same idea, trying to be as much sports specific as we can in the, in the session. And this is the test that I did in the end. So now she has completely changed the activation of the vastus lateralis and vastus medialis. So on that day, she had uh, a very good vastus medialis activation at the end of the session in the in the test. To uh, be able to uh, maintain the skills, maintain the activation, we can use a lot of theories from learning. One of them is, uh, is the reward. And what happens when you have the biofeedback, you actually you get the reward. There. It's a reward for you. While you do this, you see this come up here. That's a reward. Another reward is to be able to move to, uh, to functional exercises. And there is an offline learning as, as well. So I tell them to think about the signal. What you, what you learned in this session with me, you saw that this exercise was good and the activation was like that. When you do this at home, think about that. Because then I'm making a coupling to the, to the brain, right? And then sleep is uh, really important. So this is my excuse for sleep. I'm, I'm learning. So, and it, it is supported by research that you learn when you sleep. So there are, in training in general, we, have, we see uh, changes in the brain. It, a lot of good changes, you know, increase in synaptic activity and faster transmission of signal. 
So when we do training, we, we are not only affecting that. Basically, we are affecting every synapse from here to here. Even on a, on a spinal level, there is a control of movement. We didn't think that before, but there is. And they, there was a study on, on the cut. So they actually dissected the cut, the, the, the medulla from the brain, and the cut could still walk. So there is a step generator in the spine. So you learn also on spinal level. And I think that's important for coaches. Because actually, if you, if you uh, can make the movement so good, so efficient, that's the way to, to make it faster. I think this is a, you know, that coaches should keep this in my mind if we, if we can do this. After a uh, ACL uh, injury, there, there is changes in the brain and decreased excitability. So that's the arthrogenic muscle in inhibition working. And it, it also happens after uh, 10 days of casting that you see changes in the brain. And what we think is that th this could lead to uh, compensatory strategies that, that people get, and, and we call it maladaptive uh, plasticity. And there are several studies that support plastic changes of the uh, motor cortex during skill and resistance training. So that's fine. But where the biofeedback comes in is with uh, atten attention. So if we include the attention of, uh, of the training, uh, we could call it mind training, or then we get uh, better uh, results. So my uh, message is biofeedback with the trainer. We, we should not take the trainer out of that. And that's, that's basically my criticism of uh, traditional biofeedback study is not uh, testing this. Because this is an interaction. Traditional biofeedback study is testing her against the, the system. In reality, it's not like that. I am also getting an information. I am also taking decision based on what I see. So it's affecting two brains, mine and hers, to, uh, to try to find a, a, a better outcome. Uh, yeah, so attention, motivation is also there. The reward is also there. And the variability of, of training is also, also there. Uh, and we use this here at Aspetar for, uh, for different uh, diagnostics uh, purposes. And uh, I'm not going to dwell so long on that. How can we move on? Uh, this is a very interesting area. I, I hope you agree with me there. So if I were doing a study, uh, I would think more we have to standardize the study, I understand that. We have to have a protocol. But maybe we could say, you're a physio. This is the selection of exercises that you can choose. You don't have to choose them all. And you work with that. Another group works with that, plus the biofeedback. And then I think we can better come closer to the uh, selective, selective approach that I'm, I'm showing here, and definitely we should evaluate what changes in the, in the brain activity. So few reactions. We don't know why it works for some and not others. We, I mean, we're not sure why some people, they move on very quickly. For others, it's, it's not happening that fast. Or we're not always su successful, you know, that's, that's life. Maybe the reason is that we only see the output of the problem from the EMG, we, we don't really understand the source, what is driving this uh, motor con control uh, problem. But if we find what is driving that, we have a good results. Transfer to the sport is also important, like always in training. How does it transfer to, to sports? And 
different cues uh, seem to work for different people. That is, for her, we could say one exercise better than the other. That was, in this case, that one here with the dumbbell for another patient that might not be the best exercise. So that's why I'm, I'm using the, the biofeedback in, in training. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.